Hello, and welcome to the University of Utah Guest Writers Series. I'm Alan Borst, the administrator of the Creative Writing Program here at the U. Before we begin our event with Janet Sarbanes, we want to acknowledge that this land upon which the university is located and which is named for the Ute tribe is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Let me now introduce Jackie Balderrama, who will tell you more about today's event. Good evening and welcome everyone to the Guest Writer Series. I'm Jackie Balderrama, the Administrative Fellow helping coordinate this series with Creative Writing Administrator Alan Borst. This evening, we're really thrilled to, join, uh, to be joined by Janet Sarbanes. Uh, for tonight's program, we'll begin with an introduction by Coralie Miller, after which Janet Sarbanes will read. She will then engage in a conversation moderated by University of Utah professor Michael Mejia. We'll conclude with a Q&A from some select graduate students, then open it up to everyone. Please note that the Q&A function has been enabled at the bottom of your screens and feel welcome to share any questions for Janet there. Also know that this event is being recorded and will be made available on the U of U English YouTube channel. We encourage you to purchase books by the guest writer at your local bookstore. A link to purchase Army of One and the protester has been released at King's English Bookstore here in Salt Lake City will be, will be posted in the chat momentarily. The guest writer series was made possible through the University of Utah's English department and received funding from Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks Program and Utah Humanities. Utah Humanities empowers groups and individuals to improve their communities through active engagement in the humanities. This series is also supported in part by Utah Arts and Museums, which with funding from the state of Utah and the National Endowment for the Arts. I'd like to invite Corley Miller to turn on his camera and mic as he introduces Janet Sarbanes. Good evening, I'm Corley Miller. I'm a first year pro student here at the U and I'm here to introduce Janet Sarbanes. Janet is the author of the two short story collections, Army of One and The Protester Has Been Released, which was named as a best fiction book of 2017 by Entropy Magazine. In addition to her fiction, Janet has published art criticism and other critical writing in museum catalogs, journals, and anthologies. She is the recipient of a 2017 Creative Capital and the Warhol Foundation Art Writers Grant and a forthcoming collection of essays, Letters on the Autonomy Project in Art and Politics will be published in 2022 by Punctum. Janet teaches in the MFA and MA programs at the California Institute of the Arts, where she had the unenviable task of teaching me how to write short fiction. I'm most excited to have Janet here at Utah tonight, though, because Janet's work takes up themes of power, resistance, and autonomy that are increasingly central to our understanding of the contemporary. Her nonfiction, whether investigating the tension between Disney and Marcuse in the early years of CalArts, or reflecting on the Fluxus movement, wonders how humans create and struggle to create spaces which support freedom. Her fiction often considers the other side of the coin, whether voicing the institutional critiques of Coco the Gorilla or chronicling inspiration and abjection at a dissolving college, Janet wonders how subjects compose themselves when their circumstances seem to discourage or foreclose becoming. In these ways, Janet's work move toward, moves toward a practical and in my view, urgent ethics for the contemporary. How might we best work to become free? And what might our options be when we are thwarted? These questions, like Janet's work, will only become more essential. Here's Janet Sarbanes. Hello, everyone. Um, Coralie, thank you so much for that uh, thoughtful introduction. Uh, we miss you at CalArts, although we think you've landed in a wonderful place at University of Utah. Um, and I want to thank uh, Jackie and Alan. Um, this is a really impress impressive uh, visiting writers program you have. It seems to have many dimensions and I'm sure it takes a lot of work to organize. Um, so thank you for arranging all of that. Um, and also thanks to Michael for thinking of me uh, for this slot. 
Um, and I'm looking forward to meeting with all of the students next week. I'm already uh, really enjoying your work um, and look forward to talking to you about it. Um, I'm gonna read one story tonight before uh, we, uh, we um, have some discussion. Um, and with the weight of the events of the last week, um, you know, the mass murders in Atlanta and Boulder, and then the weight of this whole last year, um, I thought I would read a story, uh, sort of all of that weighing upon us in this moment. I thought I would read a story about solidarity in adverse conditions. Um, I've witnessed a lot of that this year, as I'm sure we all have, and I expect we'll need a lot more of it uh, in, in the years ahead. More locally, the story I'm gonna read is the story of two brothers um, and their mother, or maman, um, and it's set in a vaguely Francophone country, and it's narrated by the younger brother. Who will sit with Maman? The window leak, sorry, the window units are leaking. The tenants call and call, but there's only me to attend to them. My brother comes now and then to sit with Maman, but he can't be bothered with the building. He's off doing clever things with money. When he gets enough, when he's established, he tells Maman, he's going to send some opportunities our way. Opportunities, Maman echoes. My brother has an air conditioned feel to him when he breezes in. They all do, the ones who live in the new city. His hands are cool against Maman's brow and she groans with pleasure at his touch. But after a few minutes, he starts to sweat, loosens his tie, rolls up his sleeves. He asks for a glass of water and drinks it in one long draft, his Adam's apple bobbing up and down on his smooth shaven neck. Finally, he has to leave. His world is so different from ours now, he can't stay. Maman gazes at him with filmy eyes, trying to hold him, but she's really looking past his shoulder at the open door. Wherever she senses light, she thinks it's my brother, but it was always that way, even when she could see. He has a wife in one of the new city towers. They married on a Tahitian island that was once owned by a famous movie star in an eco hotel with a cooling system designed by the star himself. One of those exceptional individuals to whom my brother is always drawing our attention. The movie star's cooling system draws water <clears throat> from the sea and desalinates it. That's the way to go, my brother says. That's the way they have gone in the new city, but we're too far from the sea to go that way. We didn't attend the wedding. My brother invited us, of course. He even said he would buy our tickets. It was a pretty scene he staged in Maman's sick room that day, smoothing the wrinkled skin of her hand with his thumb. But Maman said she felt too weak to travel. She would only ruin his good time. I'll go to Tahiti, I said loudly over her sighing, if only to put an end to his little play. I'll come to your wedding. My brother's face hardened quickly with resentment and fear, fear that I would be the one to ruin his good time, then softened when he found his answer. But Maman, he said, raising her hand to his lips adoringly, who will sit with Maman? We've never met his wife. I don't even know if they're still married or if he already has another one. I never saw the wedding pictures. He showed them to Maman on his phone. Of course, she couldn't make them out, but she marveled over the light in the palm of his hand. 2B must be attended to first. The tenant has asthma, he cannot breathe. The window unit is fitting puffs of smoke into his room, smoke or dust, he can't determine which. But when he switches off the unit, the heat is like an oven and he can't breathe then either. I climb the stairs to 2B with my canvas bag of tools. It's surely the most valuable thing in the building and I keep a close watch on it all the time. If this bag were to disappear, I would never be able to replace its contents. It's all anyone wants now, all anyone needs, at least in our part of town, which is crumbling day by day into the desert, seared by the hot winds. The ocean breezes have all been rerouted to the new city, or so my brother tells us. 
It was a gaming tycoon who figured out how to do it. Another one of those Renaissance men he models himself after. I can hear the tenant coughing and wheezing before I get to his door. He wasn't exaggerating his need. The door's ajar. I knock once and push it open. He's irritable to be, irritable and angry. He startles when I enter, then swivels his chair toward the window without a word. When I walk over to the unit, I can see him glaring at the little puffs of dust it continues to produce in place of cold air. I turn it off and open my tool bag. All of the tenants have studio apartments, one large room in which their lives are fully on display, which makes for an uneasy intimacy when I'm making my rounds. I've been working for 10 minutes, cleaning the caked red dust from the filters and vents before 2B even speaks. It's an oven in here, he gasps, pulling at the neck of his sweat-soaked t-shirt. We're both sweating profusely. It's not that the air has gotten any hotter, it's simply more still. It sits on us, a dead weight. Do you have an inhaler, I ask? 2B laughs at the idea, and the laugh turns into a terrible coughing fit that goes on and on, punctuated by great gasps. I don't stop to assist him, nor to find him assistance. We've been through this before. He just wants the window unit fixed. I replace the filters and the vent panel and turn it on. Air comes out. It's not red. It's not dusty. It is a little cool. This is what we call fixing the unit. I don't wait for the room to cool down. I don't wait for him to breathe. I have other units to repair. The biggest unit is in Maman's bedroom. My brother found it in a dumpster in the new city, a hulking anachronism still in its box. But here it can only run when there's electricity to run it, a few hours now and then. So her room is only slightly cooler than the others. And she's no less irritable and angry than the tenants because she's dying and her favorite son lives in the new city with a wife she's never met. Where have you been, she demands, when I enter her room. Fixing the unit in 2B, I say, heaving onto the armchair by her bed. Why do you bother, she spits, dragging herself higher onto her pillows. None of them pays the rent. He has asthma, I say. He is fat, she replies. Mamma was not always like this. It was my brother who turned her against the tenants. When she was well, she was their mother too. Mamma, they cried to her from their sick beds, their child beds, their death beds even, and Mamma was there. Turn him out, she wheezes, turn them all out. Where are they supposed to go, I say. I too am irritable and angry. Do you want the gendarme to get them? The police are charged with keeping us away from the new city. They stop anyone out on the street now after dark and men from the former colonies, which is most of the men in our quarter, are taken down to the station or depending on the mood of the gendarme, beaten and left in the gutter. You're too soft, she says, lying back down again. You've always been too soft. You cried when you were a boy. Your brother, never, he would stand up to them. Neither of them knows I've told the tenants they don't have to pay me. They have no jobs, they have no money. Like me, like her, like everyone living in the shadow of the new city, they're simply waiting to see what happens next. There are forces at work and they originate elsewhere. The few that do pay are drawing on their savings and when their savings run out, I'll let them stay for free too. They're not defying me. We have an understanding. 4C is a bright eyed old man who drinks tea all day long. It's good to drink tea in hot weather, he says. We do this in India, it cools the body down. He has a bird named Plato, a gray parrot who eats out of his hand and whom he has taught to say, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a harder battle. The parrot's voice is droll. His impersonation of the philosopher makes us laugh, but it's true, you know, the old man says when we've stopped laughing. Today, I bring him a repaired window unit. I lug it up the stairs and careen into his room, landing it on the sill with a crash. I'm not an especially muscular man. The repair shops are all closed, so I've started trying to fix the compressors myself, a process of trial and error. I replace his unit, plug it in, and turn it on. Sit, sit, he urges me. He has made a fresh pot of tea. I sit and wait with him for the room to cool. 
I feel it, he says after a few minutes, straining forward in his chair. It's working. No, I say, it's no cooler than before. Yes, yes, I tell you, he says, it's, it is better. Thank you. I'll take it back down, I say. I'll try again. No need, he says graciously with a wave of his hand. You fixed it. The old man's make-believe grows tiresome. My battle's no harder than his. He's burning alive. We're all burning alive. I down my tea and leave the broken air conditioner rattling away in his apartment. The heat is very bad today. When the heat is very bad, Mama makes me call my brother. She's suffering today, I tell him, the heat. I can't get away, he says, tell her I'll come tomorrow. Tomorrow, she asks when I get off the phone in a small voice muffled by pillows. Yes, tomorrow. And that's usually enough, though he won't come tomorrow. Enough to get her to sit up and drink some water, eat her yogurt. Plain yogurt is all she takes now. I buy it at the farmer's market outside the new city wall. A quart of yogurt can be had for the price of an old armoire, a headboard, a good length of copper piping. I'm slowly stripping 3A and 4C for this purpose. They've been empty for months. 3B doesn't seem to care about her window unit, but she calls me on me frequently for other smaller repairs. In her apartment, she stays cool by wearing only a bra and panties. I enjoy making her other smaller repairs. Today, she greets me sitting at the kitchen table and holds out a flyer. She's having a party and she wants me to come. She said this before, but I've never heard party noises on the appointed day. If I'd heard party noises, I might have stopped in out of curiosity to see who was there, what people did nowadays at a party. But today she's very insistent. Her flyer has a crude unicorn drawing on it and the words white party scribbled above. What is a white party, I ask. It has a theme, she says, leaning forward excitedly. Everyone must wear white. Ah, uh, I say, why? My questions deflate her. She shrugs and rests her face in her hands. It's the theme, she says hollowly. I'll be there, I say quickly, looking over the flyer. There's no date. When is it? Tonight. Tonight? Yeah, she says, taking her hands away from her face. You got plans? I blush and look at the floor. Tonight's plan is the same as last night's and the night before. After I finish my last repair, I'll go back downstairs to sit with Maman until we both fall asleep. 3B rubs her eyes. Sorry, she mutters. I pick up my tool bag and head over to the sleeping area. I'm there to fix a wobbly shelf. It's not really so wobbly. All it takes is two or three turns of the screws. My last call of the day is 4B. The tenant is a slender, brilliant young man, a classical violinist. He practices night and day, pushing himself relentlessly as if preparing for an important concert. No one complains. The music provides an elevating soundtrack to our lives. But now it's almost too hot to play. That's why 4B has called me. He may have to stop if I can't fix the unit. Nobody wants that. He's real thin when he answers the door. He's sweating away whatever meat he had on his bones when I last saw him. He smiles wanly, his hand fluttering towards the air conditioner. Unfortunately, it's the compressor. I'll have to take it out, I say. I need to take it down to my workroom. 4B looks stricken. Okay, he says softly. As I'm prying the unit from the window, I tell him about the party in 3B. A white party, he echoes, but I'm not white. It's not like that, I explain. She means you must wear white. Ah, he says, why? It's the theme, I say. She wants it to have a theme. He nods, mulling it over. Bring your violin, I grunt, swinging the unit out of the window and hurtling towards the door. We'd love to hear you play. 4B nods again, unconvinced. I don't expect to see the old man from 4C at the party, but he's there drinking Calvados. Calvados? Where did it come from? My last bottle, he says modestly. Can you see how dusty it is? It had fallen behind the liquor cabinet. He pours me a, thumbles, a thimble's worth. The bottle was only half full, he says apologetically. I see the others have thimble worths too and are nursing them quietly around the table. Except for our hostess, 
She's made a punch out of mouthwash and is drinking a mug of it while dancing alone in the corner. Mouthwash, where did it come from? Tubi sits by the window, looking up at the moon. He has a thimble's worth of Calvados and a cup of punch. It's hot, but not as hot as the day. He breathes easier now, his massive chest rising and falling in a bright white guayavera. The violinist steals into the room and looks around, then hides his instrument in the corner. I nod to him and smile, but he looks away, embarrassed. Our hostess takes him by the hand, but he doesn't wish to dance. He's dressed in white like the rest of us, but whereas I have on a white t-shirt and painter's pants, he's wearing white slacks, a white tuxedo shirt and white patent leather shoes. The only one who can match him is our hostess in her Mexican wedding dress, a fake camellia in her hair. I wish he would dance with her. I'd like to see them dance together. I'm just about to ask them to when the power goes out and the music stops. She shrieks and curses, kicks the stereo. He draws her gently by both elbows into the sleeping area. Perhaps they will dance after all. The rest of us sit in silence, licking our empty Calvados glasses. We can't quite make up our minds to go. The moonlight streams in at the window, picking up the white of our garments. We're like the lost crew of a ghost ship frozen in time. Like I said, we've all heard his music before. We hear it every day, but never before in the same room. We put down our glasses. She looks up from her quilt. May we stay in this moonlit darkness forever, listening to the racing notes and watching him feel his way towards freedom. The next day, my brother brings a group of investors to see the building. The tenants and I are wrecked and defenseless. We drank the mouthwash punch when the power came back on and danced until it went off just before dawn. Our doors are unlocked, our white garments strewn about. We lie sprawled in compromising positions, though our breath smells surprisingly good. The investors step purposefully through the mess. They, have only, eye, they only have eyes for the building, the high ceilings, the built-ins and wood floors, the good clean lines. Maman has gussied herself up to meet them, but they pass by her door without entering. Only my brother ducks in to talk to her in a low voice before quickly rejoining the group. For me, he has sharper words. This is my brother, the current building manager, he says scornfully. You can see what he's done with the property. You stripped the upstairs apartments, didn't you, you degenerate? The investors stand impassively, all except one, a slim blonde with a blinding white smile. His new wife, perhaps. How marvelous, she cries, pointing at me. I sit up, clutching my head, trying to understand in what way I am marvelous. But her finger doesn't move. She's pointing at the bay window. Are there more of those, she asks my brother. In my mother's bedroom, he answers, waving them into the hallway. Now Mama will finally get to meet her. Afterwards, I learned that they walked into 3 B's apartment and found her making love to the violinist. Back in five minutes, my brother said brusquely, stepping out and shutting the door. 3B threw her shoe at the door, then opened it and threw her other shoe at the back of my brother's head. Magnificent woman. Sometime later, I walked into Maman's bedroom to find her and my brother wreathed in smiles. He has an open bottle of champagne in his hand. She's even drinking a little. The building is sold, they tell me in unison. Sold, I gasp. Yes, Maman croaks, isn't it wonderful? It's not a huge sum of money, my brother says, but it will provide Maman with a nice tidy income. But how, I ask, still dumbstruck. I never thought it would actually happen. Why would anyone from the new city want to live out here? My brother gazes at me coldly, though as usual, he is sweating from every pore. Do you ever turn on the tablet I gave you? When was the last time you read the news? The new city is expanding, it's right around the corner. They've renamed this the historic quarter, Maman says. Our building will go on a registry. Everyone will want to live here. But Maman, I say, it won't be our building. My brother waves his hand. Maman will be allowed to stay. And me, I ask, and the tenants? My brother smirks. The tenants must go, of course, and you, well, you can't really expect them to keep you on. You act as if you aren't one of the investors, I sneer. He's not going to win this one so easily. The main investor, I'll wager. And your wife. Did you even tell Maman that was your wife? The blonde who loves bay windows? This is a low blow. 
a lunge in the dark really, but I can see by the way his face hardens that it has landed. Maman turns to him with a fish-eyed stare. Your wife, she whispers feebly, her hand fluttering to her heart. My brother sets the champagne bottle down on her bedside table. Get out, he says to me through clenched teeth. But Maman, I whisper, I simper, who will sit with Maman? You will not ruin this, he howls. She rules, she rolls over with her back to us. Maman, he says gently, touching her back. She doesn't answer. She doesn't move. Her nightgown sticks to her shoulder blades, which jut out sharply like bro broken wings. I'm leaving now, Maman, he says softly. I'll be back tomorrow. Still no response. He turns to go and staggers a bit under the weight of what we both know. She's going to die now. From Maman's bay window, you can see a patch of dirt that was once a prodigious garden. She used to leave baskets of sun-ripened tomatoes in the lobby for the tenants, bags of sweet lemons, cut flowers in jars, sunflowers and delphinium. Do you remember how it used to be? Now the earth is hard and riddled with cracks, many small, some large, like desiccated veins. You can no longer till it, your shovel clangs with the effort, and anyway, what's the point? Our wheezing old window units exacerbate the problem, but we can't turn them off. This is the case everywhere, but in the new city, which is doused in desalinated water, a bright green insult on the horizon we try never to look at. Maman was gone before the close of escrow. She simply gave up trying to eat after that and eventually to breathe, but the tenants and I remain. We received our notices, but the eviction date came and went and no one showed up to turn us out. The tenants all came to her funeral. They mourned sincerely. They shook my brother's hand. Some of them were brought into this world by Maman, they told him, and they wanted to see her out. But that's not what slowed down the process. We all know that. It's something beyond even my brother's control. The new city is biding its time. Other timelines appear. 2B has lung cancer, it turns out. 3B and the violinist are expecting a baby. We focus on those eventualities and not the other. We gather in the coolest rooms. We pamper 2B and 3B in whatever ways we can. By and large, the mood is good. In the heat of the day, we sit together at a table in front of Maman's window unit, playing cards, joking and laughing. Yes, why not laugh? The gendarmes are circling the building, but they haven't taken it yet. Thank you. Thanks so much, Janet. I, I love that story. I'm so glad you read that. Thank you. Um, and, and also, just first of all, I love this book um, uh, a, a lot. And one of the things that I, I love about it and find sort of fascinating is it's availability, right? Um, that is, um, you know, the language, the style are not hard. The, um, the forms of the pieces are not, uh, they, they may not be um, conventional in every case, but they're also not sort of difficult to interpret at their surface. Like there's all this great humor, you know, on display in this particular piece that is very inviting into the, in, into the book. So it's often very funny, um, but it also takes us to these very, you know, sort of devastating um, and often sort of insoluble situations, right? Sort of like, you know, um, often having to do with the climate crisis, right? These sort of situations uh, as in this particular story or Coyoacan where, you know, the, um, the sort of ground situation is not possible to be resolved by the characters in the, in the text. Um, and, and in doing this, I mean, there, it seems like there's this really um, sort of poignant political work being done uh, as well. So, so, th so ultimately the question I think is really, sorry, I'm, I'm interested to, if you would talk a bit about the relationship between access and accessibility and the political work that you're doing um, in, 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 the, in a book, in, the, in this book. Thank you, uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I do kind of admire sort of plain spokenness um, and sort of direct language. And I actually think 
that kind of derives from having grown up listening to a lot of political speeches where you kind of, um, it's almost like, you know, it's common sense in a way um, that moves people uh, to act on their own behalf, to organize on their own behalf or to, um, or, or to kind of move to change things. Um, and, you know, some of the most brilliant orators that I, uh, I, I really admire, someone like um, Malcolm X actually used uh, uh, direct speech kind of um, uh, sort of, um, yeah, colloquialisms, you know, kind of a plain spoken approach extremely effectively to kind of strip away. Um, uh, I think it's a, a very effective way to talk about power or to get at power or to analyze power. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and, it, and it can move people as well. Um, I do, I do use a lot of humor in my work. Um, I mean, I would just say on the subject of plain spokenness that um, uh, Beckett in the literary arenas is, is a big influence on me um, so that that plain spokenness gets at issues of power, but it also gets at sort of existential questions like what is my purpose, right? In a purposeless world. Like, um, and I always try to have a kind of, um, I, I'm not, I use satire, I use dark humor, um, but I, I wouldn't say I'm fully a satirist because I don't go so far as to burn everything down. I always have a character who believes the world could be a better place, right? Who insists that on seeing something good in the world, even though sort of all of these things are, um, are sort of confronting them. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and the humor, as far as accessibility, you know, I, I know that my satire and my humor comes, there's a kernel of anger that I begin with where I'm angry about some injustice, right? Some cruelty or some assault on freedom as um, Corley was, was referencing or a particular logic that I find constraining and brutalizing that people are forced to or they choose to uh, to kind of conform to and to live by. And so I kind of want to go after that, um, but that's just the starting point and it's kind of the motor. Um, but then I try to use the satire and the humor um, to kind of pull people in to remind people that they can laugh at power, right? Um, and that uh, to kind of show up the ridiculous of the situation and that can drain it of its power. Um, you, you can't always do that, you know, and sometimes you, you miss the mark because sometimes um, things aren't, just aren't funny. <laughs> but, um, but I think that's the impulse at work that answers your question. Absolutely, that, that's such a, um, such a great answer. And I think um, so helpful sort of help me thinking about this, this book. And, and it is, I mean, I think that's another sort of remarkable thing about it is that um, for as devastating as the situations are, I mean, like you never, you never sort of try to tackle the entirety of the climate, cl uh, the climate crisis, right? There's sort of like the, the perpetual storm in one story, there's a, the, the drought um, that's sort of, and um, the encroachment of this sort of like, um, specialized island of, 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 of survival, you know, in another story, et cetera. Um, and yet, you know, sort of interestingly, like there's, you know, uh, there is a kind of hopefulness in the, in the book as well. And, and there's, uh, there, there's, you know, a, a, a eternally like this one character, like uh, the violinist and, and uh, who was it with Mama, who's that sort of um, brings in that possibility of, of, you know, some kind of resistance, right? I mean, uh, to, to complete um, and utter um, uh, devastation and depression, right? Um, and so I, I guess what's, what's interesting about that too is I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about like the predominance of the first person in a lot of these, in these stories, right? I mean, um, and how, 
that seems to get at a central tension in all of them, which is that that relationship between the individual and the, and, and the community, right? And sort of developing of alternative communities even. So I, I, do you wanna talk about that a, a little bit? I mean, sort of like um, maybe the impulse toward the first person. I, I mean, I'm thinking about Koyokan in particular where you have two first person narratives side by side and that, you know, the friction that's created there, but also a kind of possibility that develops out of that. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you very much for that question as well. Um, I do use first person a lot. Um, I think it's, you know, as it always is, it's a way of, of giving voice to people or just creatures who don't have voices, right? They're, there are three stories in this collection that are narrated by animals um, and animals who were all the subject of um, science experiments. Um, uh, uh, well, Dolly the clone sheep, it's, that story is narrated by her, the, the sheep that her uh, cell, the, the cloning cell was taken from, Coco the gorilla, and then Laika the space dog. Um, I was really interested there in, in giving language to animals because language is associated, it, it's, it's one of the things that philosophers insist makes humans human, right? We have language and, and, and animals don't. And so what happens when you give animals language, even though of course it's my, um, I, I, I'm kind of uh, projecting that onto them. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, particularly in that situation where they're the object of an experiment to, to use the first person has a particular power um, to kind of, again, sort of rewrite uh, the narrative and to rewrite um, particularly political discourse around science. Uh, um, and uh, um, I think that sort of, I'm also interested in polyvocality, yes. And so having these um, kind of multi-viewpoint uh, narrations is a way of bringing the, you're, you're creating a kind of collectivity out of these individuals, right? It's not, um, it's kind of, their, their narratives are woven together. Often I will alternate say between two uh, narrators. I learned a lot about that from reading to Toni Morrison, who I think is so brilliant with the multi-viewpoint narrative. Um, but I think I'm, I'm compelled by it because um, it, uh, yes, it, it, it creates a, um, a, a kind of autonomous collectivity that um, is, uh, allows both for the individual to kind of be who they are and to be fully their own pers persona and their own character, um, but then also begins to describe um, a community, um, a, a, a sort of um, uh, a kind of, um, you know, intersubjectivity, I guess I would say. Um, and I'm really interested in that kind of exercise of putting the individual into relation with, uh, with the collective. And I guess lastly, I would say, um, I shy away from the kind of authoritative, omniscient third person, the distance third person. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and sort of try to collapse narrator and character into one um, because I'm interested uh, about the, I'm interested in the effects of that um, uh, as far as they're taking on whatever kind of structure or discourse um, that is oppressing them, yeah. That's great, thank you so much. Um, I, have, I have more questions, but uh, I'm gonna uh, guide us over to Corley uh, and then Daniel, and then we've got uh, other Q and A's coming in. So uh, Corley, uh, you're up with your question. Uh, Janet, a bit less technical, um, but while I was, um, while I was working on the introduction, I think my gloss was that your nonfiction is often concerned with utopia and your fiction is often concerned with dystopia. Um, 
And I found myself wondering, um, you know, as you noted in the in your introduction to the story, uh, we've all been through quite a bit, both over the last week and the last couple of years. I wonder how your thoughts about uh, either kind of topia or about America as a space for topian attempts um, has evolved over the last couple of years. Oh, thanks, Corley. Um, that's a great question. Um, I actually think uh, we have an enormous opportunity to do things differently. I don't know if we are going to take that opportunity and that's always the question, but I think that, um, and I do teach a lot. I teach a class on utopias at CalArts um, from the 19th century through, uh, through to the present. Um, and uh, particularly in the American tradition, I do think we're at a moment where you have the kind of possibility that you had in this other great era of um, upheaval in, in, in the 60s, um, both because of the kind of political um, formations that we've seen um, uh, rise up and develop um, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, being being a major one, um, Me Too, uh, the Me Too movement being another, um, and uh, just and Standing Rock, another phenomenal one, um, where the radical imagination has suddenly gotten really big again, gotten really ambitious, and then I think when and which it should be and it should always be. Um, and it's, it, it's asking that we really rethink through every structure and not just think them through and talk them through, but actually change them this time around. And that is just an amazing moment to live in and an amazing energy to feel. And then I think because the, um, the pandemic showed us that we could completely change our lives, our everyday lives drastically, right? Um, that all of a sudden we could be doing everything different and notably that we could shut down the way things work. We could shut down essentially the way capitalism work. We, 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 we certainly could change the way our lives are organized to some extent. I'm not saying that um, we shut down capitalism. I'll take that back. But, but things could kind of um, could change remarkably and, and not that that was um, a, uh, that was evenly distributed in terms of that kind of change. Certainly the essential workers had to keep going to work under um, on really uh, trying um, and life-threatening circumstances. Um, and certainly childcare was um, what, what was incredibly um, uh, onerous uh, uh, when all the schools were closed, all of those things. So I'm not saying everything was good but I'm saying that it showed us that we could really change things. And I think in a way that and the George Floyd protests, right? Um, and that moment where people said, you know, uh, we're not gonna sit in our houses and take this, right? Um, and the combination of that, I think is, is very hopeful. Um, uh, and I think um, alliances and solidarities are being are being built and being formed. And I just hope they don't kind of get uh, shut down. And I hope we keep that sense of possibility that we can change things, but we can change things the way we want them to be. Because um, of course there were dystopic aspects to all the shutdown and dystopic aspects to all of the lives that have been taken um, because of the pandemic. Um, but it's true about the 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 um, mass shootings as well. We could we could we could really do something, um, and I think we could really do something because a lot of people believe that we could. But I don't know if it's the, the system will allow it yet. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Obviously, it's a question that really gets me going. Daniel is up next with the question. Hi, thank you so much for being here. My name is Daniel Uncle I'm a second year PhD student in creative writing. Um, you and Michael actually just touched pretty directly on parts of my question, but I'm still gonna pose it because I find it for selfish reasons a very interesting topic. Um, 
your short fiction that I've read at least seems to me to be pretty invested in both uh, taking out unique perspectives and in tackling the inequality between the individual and the institution. Um, as someone interested as well in the personhood of animals, stories like Lie Like a Lie and Meet Coco occupy a very rich intersection of those investments. I'd love to hear just any method or practice you might have found for adopting these particularly non-human but still peopled perspectives. Um, you know, how do you get inside the head of a canine cosmonaut? And maybe, and this is maybe a little like provocative, but what more responsibilities might you have once you're in there? Not to, you know, the social, the status quo, but to the personhood of the, the you know, the historical figure you're, you're taking advantage of. So um, in other words, how do you as a writer access these unique inferiorities? Yeah. Just practically, and then do you have, have you ever encountered any kind of ethical brush up in doing so that we might find when we, you know, occupy human perspectives as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, that's, that's a wonderful question um, and very insightful. Um, Laika was the first uh, of these kind of animal stories that I wrote and I was just inspired by a set of paintings I saw at a place called the Museum of um, uh, 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 Jurassic, uh, tech, um, Jurassic Technology by um, an artist named, I think it's P.M. Piers, A.M. Piers. And it was uh, portraits of all of the Soviet space dogs. I had never heard of them before. So then I kind of started looking it up because the portraits were very moving, right? Um, the, dog, the dog portrait is its own genre, um, but sometimes an artist um, can, really, can really nail it. And, um, I wanted to, yeah, try to understand what it is to be another being and not by thinking about them or writing about them. Um, you know, although of course there's all this wonderful stuff in animal studies um, that, that does exactly that, but by thinking and writing as them. And of course I can do that and they won't say to, you know, they, they, they won't, um, uh, uh, challenge me on that, which is, I think is the point uh, that you're making. But I wanted to know if there was an understanding we could access through the imagination that was different um, than, than other ways of kind of understanding the human animal relationship um, and animals themselves. And that would both acknowledge the limits of our experience and then, and then go beyond them. So I really thought of those as fables for our time. Um, and there's a long tradition of animal fables, right? In every folklore around the world. Um, and it, it's a way of thinking with animals, I guess, um, that we will create a parallel cast of animals, right? Um, to whom we ascribe human behaviors like the, the cunning fox and the loyal dog, which is uh, like a, and the powerful lion. Um, and, uh, but, but in a sense that's anthropomorphizing the animal. Um, and I was interested in trying to kind of zoomorphize the reader and zoomorphize myself, right? Meaning make myself more animal. And again, these terms are completely culturally saturated. Um, but I thought there might be some little way in which I could get beyond um, um, just the, the purely human as we, as we think about it now. Um, and I, I, I was attracted to writing with animal pr protagonists because um, I, you know, something has to change urgently, right? Uh, in the way we orient ourselves towards the rest of the planet we need to self-limit um, and maybe this would help us to see the ways in which we have um, uh, just transgressed boundaries, um, uh, uh, you know, in particularly with these experiences. Um, and yeah, I think, um, I did want to show in a way all of these animals are better than we are. <laughs> That's certainly a strain through it. So there may be, there, there's an idealizing impulse in there um, 
that I that I recognize. Um, but for me, it was a way to look back, you know, in a sense at the human. Like a, as far as the way, the form it's written, um, written in, the way it's written is the closest to where I really strain to think like a dog as I, but I, I know I could have gone so much further. Um, and I imagine, I, I'm excited to see what other people might do because the further you can go with that, the more you can zoomorphize, I think, the more you can just kind of somehow get just a little bit um, beyond the human. Um, I don't know if you have a follow-up question because I'm not sure that I answered that um, completely, but. Um, no, that was very fascinating and very thoughtful. Thank you so much. It gave me a lot to think about. Okay. I'll give it back to Michael now. Super. Thanks so much, you guys, for those questions. We have um, another question from the audience. This is from Alex Ortega, and he says that he loved the story. Um, and uh, uh, from someone who's new to your work, uh, what's the context that situates the story in a francophone country? And why are the words mama and gendarme uh, the linguistic indicators of that? Oh, <laughs> what a great insight. Um... There's certainly aspects of that story that draw on my own experience of gentrification, right, in, in Los Angeles. Um, but, and in fact, that image of a, uh, an apartment building with all of the, I was actually gonna use that for my background. There's uh, an apartment building in downtown LA. It's an SRO um, building and every, every window has a leaking air conditioner, right? Um, and it's, uh, it's this incredible grid that you see. And then you just see the, the kind of the, the water leaking. And I don't know, it seemed to stand in for, for so many things. But I wanted to um, kind of defamiliarize that a little bit. And also in LA, we have a kind of relationship to the desert because LA really should be a desert, but um, we, we water it. Uh, relentlessly, and there's a desert on the edge of it. So, so that was kind of in there. Um, but then I also wanted to uh, kind of, I, I didn't want it to be too recognizable. And I wanted to kind of get the history of um, colonization in there to some extent and, 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 and to flag the, um, the kind of moment of, of, of climate uh, stress or climate catastrophe that we are living through or we will soon be living through as also a kind of um, post-colonial kind of uh, um, a moment in a moment about uh, European countries that extracted the resources, right? Because that is part of what gets us in this, all this trouble with our relentless extraction of fossil fuels and, and all of that. Um, and memo, I think, was, was, was very important to, to use the word for mother to, to kind of signal that. Um, uh, there, there were associations with Mother Earth. I'm sure it, it's, a, it's an earth that's become dry and desiccated. It's a mother that's dying, but also a mother that's turned against her tenants and that there was previously something more um, almost, you know, uh, something, something was happening earlier that she was a part of that was a good thing. And now the, the just that the fight over resources and also the, the decision to go with a new city or to, to, to leave the poor quarters behind in the old city um, where most of the people from the former colonies live. Um, uh, so there's, there, there's kind of been that decision and that, that there no longer is a memo in a way, right? We can't kind of um, go back to that who provides, you know, flowers and fruit and, and, and things in the, 
in the uh, in the lobby to the tenants. Um, and then gendarme, um, yeah, it was it was a way to get at policing and to link policing to resource extraction to the colonial project. Um, and also just to kind of emphasize those two things, the mother and the police um, for the reader to make them stand out. I hope that answers your question. It's a great question. That was really great. And I, um, I really appreciate that answer. I, I, I'm thinking again about how, um, yeah, the, 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 the way in which the traditional family is sort of shown as in, in crisis right from the beginning, right? And that there's, there is this, you know, what's really at stake in a sense is a different kind of community, right? The, the one that Mama had fostered when she went in, in the past um, and that sort of reforms around those values at the end as a, as a form of resistance, which is really, really fantastic. And again, I like what I love about that story and so many of these stories is the way in which you layer so many of these sort of crises in um, uh, together in, in, in really deft ways. So I think um, unless we get an, another question here, um, I'm going to ask sort of sort of a selfish question um, because I know you, in the past you've talked about um, the influence on Latin American writing on on, on your work, um, and I'm just I'm just curious if you would talk a little bit about um, which authors in particular have been uh, sort of useful for you and sort of thinking about both. Uh, perhaps style, but also the political, right? I mean, I think um, because that, the, the, that's so intertwined with what um, uh, so many Latin American authors are producing or have been producing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that uh, has particularly attracted me to Latin American uh, writers has been the kind of um, the, the, the playfulness with form and the kind of innovation um, and then the, uh, but, but that's like not um, uh, kind of posed against um, the kind of political stuff. It's, it's a part of it, you know, it's all kind of part and parcel. So uh, Julio Cartazar was very important for me, um, particularly just, uh, I mean, he, he, he himself was such an inspiring writer in terms of his politics and his political engagement. Um, but then the way he, and I, I think you can say this about you know, the magical realists as well, just shows how the political warps the everyday in, in such interesting ways or, or places this pressure on it um, that makes things kind of, uh, not make sense or, or be very strange or even you know function according to different laws of physics, right? And all of that is just like outside the frame, but it is the kind of political um, uh, pressing in. Um, and that just, he's so brazen about shortness. Like I love Cronopio's Ifamas because, you know, it's just like, yeah, you can just do a whole little book, you know, things this big. Um, uh, a whole book of little things that big um, that they just really pack a punch. I mean, Lydia Davis is another person who's had a lot of um, uh, influence on me um, and, and just like her willingness to go down to a single sentence story. I just, that was, that blew my mind. That was great. Um, uh, and I, I was kind of interested in some of the pieces in here that are more maybe political in a more recognizable sense, like the protester has been released or the tragedy of Ayapaneko, I was interested in taking what she does with like a, a short chunk that's titled and then putting it to different ends to kind of intervene socially, politically, not so much kind of philosophically as she does or these kind of logic games that she plays. Um, but I mean, sort of more, and, and uh, Roberto Bolaño is a, is a big influence. Um, uh, because of um, the uh, um, kind of his use of anecdote and just kind of how he just will ramble on and, and, and the orality of his, of his stories. Um, and I think, you know, 
always, you know, that's another thing going back to this question of why first person, it's, it's like a story somebody will sit next to you and tell you, and, and maybe you're on the bus and you don't really even want to hear the whole thing, but they keep going on and on. Um, and that pushes up against kind of the written word or the literary word um, in, in interesting ways. Um, uh, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I, there, there are lots of other people I can think of. I mean, in, in this current moment, I think there's some really interesting things going on in um, Chicanx literature, like uh, uh, what Carmen Maria Machado is, is doing, kind of use, deploying lit, uh, uh, kind of body horror in a literary way. I think that's also tied to um, the, the Latin American tradition, the, the kind of magical realist, um, surrealist tradition. Um, my own mentee, former mentee, Caribbean Fragosa has a great um, uh, book out on city lights that is in this kind of, uh, this, this same vein. Uh, someone like Seshu Foster uh, just came out with uh, a novel, uh, A History of the East LA Dirigible Transport Lines. that's so innovative. And so um, it's all about kind of East, East Los Angeles. Um, uh, and uh, um, I, I just love that kind of ability to do satire and just let it kind of unspool into the, into the, surreal, uh, the surreal. Um, Yuri Herrera is another contemporary uh, writer that I like. Um, yeah. I hope that answers your question. It sure does. Yeah, I love Yuri's work. And um, yeah, so um, I, I, yeah, I was definitely thinking, obviously, of Axolotl, but um, with uh, Koyo Akan, but uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about um, House Taken Over as well. So yeah, 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 for sure. This, this, um, in there. Well, um, I think, unless we have any other questions coming in, that is uh, going to conclude things for tonight. And I'll turn it over to Alan. Just want to say thank you again so much, Janet. Like uh, this has just been a fantastic reading, and uh, you know all the answers to our questions have been wonderful. So uh, appreciate everything you've done for us. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. Yes, Janet. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Um, thank you for enriching us with your reading and your conversation. It's been really uh, thought provoking and. Uh, quite compelling um, and, and thank you for making it so timely as well. Um, for those of you in attendance, we'll be hosting Miranda Mellis in a couple of weeks, so uh, be on the lookout for information for her event. Thank you also to Michael Mejia, Jackie Balderrama, Daniel Unkefer, and Corley uh, for participating in this evening's event. And thank you again, Janet. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you. The pleasure was all mine. Thanks everybody and take good care. Take care. Bye.